I invite you to open your Bibles, your copy of the Word of God, to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Take your copy of God's Holy Word and find Ephesians after Galatians before Philippians. Ephesians chapter number 5. What has 15 actors, four settings, two writers, and one plot, the 648 Hallmark Christmas movies that you'll watch this year. It's that time of year, isn't it? So over the next five Sundays, we are asking this question. Today's part one, next week will be part two, and so on. But today, part one, uh, we're asking this question, as we'll ask it the next five weeks, and the question is... Why did Christ come at Christmas? Now, we're not asking a timing question. We're not asking about the timing of His coming. We're asking the reasons for or about the reasons for His coming. So each week we're going to identify a different reason why Jesus came. And again, these are not in any particular order, okay? Uh, These are just, we're going to stay in Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 5, man, there are just... Several reasons why we can point to Christ coming the first time. And so today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. That's the whole text today. Uh, one verse, we'll, we'll comment on other verses of course, but here's our text. Ephesians 5, verse 1, if you're there, say I'm there. Here we go, let's look at it together. The Word of God The Bible says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Father, we pray you'll not only help us understand this text today, but let us stand under it by faith. We ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, and God's people said. So our big idea, the main idea of this message, the first reason we're going to look at why Jesus came at Christmas, I've worded it this way, I call it the takeaway. Christ came so we could be imitators of God, not just image bearers of God. Okay, Every human being was created in the image of God. We're all image bearers, believers and non-believers. But as believers, Christ came not only so we could be image bearers of God, but that so we could be imitators of God. That's a tall order. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, but this is what we're called to do. Jesus came so we could be imitators of God, not just image bearers of God. Our chiefest, our highest, our greatest worship of God is not in our admiration of God, though we should admire Him. It's not in our adoration of God. It's not in our contemplation of God. It's not even in our meditation of God. Our greatest, chiefest, highest worship is in our imitation of God. We are called to be imitators of God. So, don't just be an admirer of God. Don't just be an encourager of God or a a believer of God or a defender of God. Be an imitator of God. Don't just be a a confessor of God, a a fearer of God, an honorer of God, a goalkeeper of God. Be, Be an imitator of God. Well, that seems like a tall order. Well, there's a couple of insights in this one verse that I think is going to help us today. Two of them that I want you to see. Here's the first insight I pray you'll see today. And that is, it is impossible to imitate God in everything. We, it's an impossibility to imitate God in everything. We can't imitate Him in everything. Paul uh, makes that clear in this whole chapter. That it's possible to imitate God, but it's impossible to imitate Him in everything. 
Some things feel impossible, right? Like when you try to enter your password and you get incorrect password, incorrect password, incorrect password. And then you're prompted to reset your password. So you reset the password. Then you get this helpful message. Your new password can't be your old password. Well, I'm just trying to enter my password. That feels impossible, doesn't it? But imitating God in everything, that doesn't... It may feel impossible, but it is impossible. We cannot imitate Him in everything. Paul says it like this in verse 1. He uses this, this word, therefore, right? In Ephesians 5 verse 1, the therefore literally means because of this reason, accordingly, so... And it's a marker of a result. What this word is about to introduce us to is the result of what precedes this word. Everything that falls before this word results in this being a possibility. Therefore. So it's always good to look at what lies before the therefore to see what the therefore is actually there for. Why is it here? Well, it's here based upon Ephesians 1, 2, 3, and 4. The result of chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 is the imitators of God. That's the result of what precedes it. We are required because we're in Christ, because who we are with Christ is not who we were without Christ. Because of that, because we're in Christ, because we're born again, because we're saved in Jesus, if indeed you are, therefore you are required to be an imitator of God. This is not a suggestion. You're required, and it doesn't mean do it one time. This is a continual sanctification, growing up in your faith, be imitators of God. Now, before you can do that, you, you have to understand there's some prerequisites that you must prescribe to. There's some truths you must trust. And one of those is you have to be convinced of your own sin. You have to be convinced that you are a sinner and that your sin has separated you from God. You've got to be convinced, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, before the therefore, Paul wrote that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, that you were following. That word following means imitating, that you were imitating. You were imitating the course of the world and you were imitating the, the prince of the power of the air. You were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And you were by very nature, you were a child of wrath, the Bible says. Due to sin before Christ, you are imitating Satan, not God. You're a child of Satan, not God, because of sin and it's sep how it separated you from God. You've got to be convinced of your own sin if you can ever get to the possibility where this is even possible. You have to be convinced of your own sin. Yet we live in a world that is convinced that sin does not exist. That's the world we live in. There is no sin. Sin doesn't exist. I, I was, I don't know why I'm surprised anymore. I, I don't know why. I, I read this headline this week and I just like, seriously? Here's the headline. I'm just going to quote the headline. CNN unearths audio like this is some earth-shattering catch they made. Right? They unearth audio that they acquired. So here's how the headline reads. CNN unearthed audio of new house speaker calling humans inerrantly evil. End quote. When did we get to the place where something that is supposed to be just common knowledge is now headline news? Is it that much... To make it headline news that a professing follower of Christ actually believes what the Bible says? The Bible teaches we are inerrantly evil. Our hearts are desperately wicked. There is no one good, no, 
not one. All of us are evil. We all are outside of Christ. Every one of us. Yet we live in a world that looks at inherently evil and they describe it, they call it indescribably good. And they look at indescribably good and they call it inherently evil. So we live in a world that says sin doesn't exist. Yet in order for this to happen, we have to be convinced of our own sin. We have to really believe that we were dead in our trespasses. We have to be convinced of that. That if you're not in Christ today, you are dead in your trespasses. And you're, you're lost without Christ. And you're headed to hell without Christ. And you've got to be convinced of it. You've got to be convinced of the fact that what every one of us deserves is hell. And that's it. We have to be convinced of our sin. Then on top of that, it's not, that's just Ephesians 2. Then we get to Ephesians 3. And we have to be convinced that there is one who can purify that sin. And there is one who can pardon that sin. There is one Savior and His name is Jesus. And He came to save His people from their sins. And, and, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His name is Christ. Above Him there is no other name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is your only hope to have your sin forgiven and redeemed and be reconciled back to God. It only comes through Christ. Paul said it this way in chapter 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Boy, this is good stuff. In order to, to, for this to even be a possibility to imitate God, we have to be convinced of our own sin and we have to be convinced that there's one Savior who can save us from our sin. You say, Pastor, are you saying that Jesus is the only way that we can be saved? He's the only way we can go to heaven. He's the only way any person will ever be able to be redeemed and forgiven and pardoned of their sin. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And you say, well, pastor, that is so exclusive. That is so limited to say Jesus' nail-scarred hands is the only way that I can be saved is so narrow-minded. It is so politically incorrect, and I agree with you a hundred. It is limited. It is exclusive to say Jesus is the only way that anybody can ever be saved. It is so narrow-minded. It is so politically correct, incorrect, but praise God, it is also so true. It is true. You can be saved. Yes, you can. It's, it's, it'll blow your mind if you think about it. That those who were dead, children of wrath, can now be alive and children of God. For, for those who believed in His name, who called upon His Name For those who received Him, God the Father gave them the right to become children of God. Amazing. we got to be convinced of this. If this is ever going to be a possibility, you've got to be convinced of your sin. You've got to be convinced that there's a Savior who can change you. And then there's this whole... Take your Bibles. Go to Ephesians 1, verse 5. Go to chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. This whole idea of adoption. The spirit of adoption. Wow. Okay, we're convinced of our sin. Convinced that Jesus is the only way we can be saved. And then when that happens, when we're born again, look what happens. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.5 So Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 Be imitators of God. This is an appropriate application of Ephesians 1.5 the appropriate application of Ephesians 1.5, I've been adopted as a son through Jesus Christ. In love, He predestined me for such. So how does that, how does that apply to my life? Imitate, be an imitator of God. This is an appropriate application to Ephesians 1.5. Some of us have yet to adapt to our adoption. It takes time to adapt to it, Right? If you know anything about adoption, it takes some adapting. 
for the adoptee and the adopter. There's some, adapt, some, some adaptation that has to take place, and we need to adapt to our adoption. This, this is a process, right? This happens over time as we imitate God, and imitate God, and imitate God. It's clear that we are called, because of what's happened to us in Christ, to be imitators of God. Now, this, this whole idea here in a Jewish mindset was anathema. No way. No way a Jew could get their mind around this imitators of God. Because remember, original sin, Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God. Right? And second commandment said there should be no likeness of God. So in a Jewish mindset, in Paul's mind, before Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus, if you said, Paul, you need to be an imitator of God, he'd have looked at you like you had two heads and said, if you're telling me that I can imitate the invisible heavenly Father, you've lost your mind. That's an anthema. But in Christ, Paul now, who believed one way, is now convinced of this. And he's calling all of us who are in Christ to be imitators of God. Wow. Be imitators of God. It's simple, yet so profound, isn't it? How is it possible for a human being to imitate God? It doesn't say be immune to God. People people claim they're immune to God. Atheists, they they just have so much more faith than I do. Right? They just say we're immune to God. God doesn't exist. You know, here's the reality of that. If, If there were no God, there would be no atheist. The very fact that there are atheists is proof that God exists. Now, Paul's not arguing for the existence of God at all here. He's calling us to live as imitations of God. uh, To follow His example. Now, the word imitate is an interesting word. It's a word that means uh, to follow. It can mean that word. The Greek word is is. Mimitai, we get our word mimic, our English word mimic. We're to mimic God. We're to follow Him. We're to imitate Him. And that's a, you think about that and say, what? I can't. And there are, there's some things that we, it's impossible for us to imitate God in everything. And we'll talk about those here in a moment. But what Paul is telling us to do is to take what we've learned and live it out. This is not the way you learned Christ, Paul says in chapter 4. We're to copy and paste what we learn and live it out in our lives. We're to imitate God. Now, again, we can't imitate God in everything. We can't create. We're not creators. We're created beings, right? Only God is the creator. Paul reminds us in Romans 1, God gave them up in their lust of their hearts because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator right we're not creators we are created beings so we can't imitate God in his creation we can't imitate God in his knowledge he knows all things he is omniscient he knows all things we don't know all things we can't imitate God in his power he's all powerful he's omnipotent we are not we're not all powerful we can't imitate God in his omnipresence he's everywhere we're not We can't imitate God in that. We can't imitate God in His independence. God is in need of nothing. He exists outside of everything. He is in need of nothing. We are in need of Him. So we cannot imitate God in that way. We cannot imitate God in His majesty and in His greatness. Only He is worthy of our worship. Amen? We're not worthy of that kind of worship. Only He is. So we can't imitate. There's, There's some ways we cannot imitate God. We cannot imitate Him in everything. Paul is not calling us here to to be gods. He's not saying, therefore, be God. Right? He's not calling us to be God. The Mormons teach that the Heavenly Father used to be a man. And so us men, women, boys, and girls can one day become gods. The fifth president of the LDS church said this, and I quote, As man is now, God once was. As God is now, man may be. End quote. That's a 
lie from the pit of hell. That is heresy, that is unbiblical, that is false, that is wrong. Paul is not calling us to be gods here. He's not even advocating. That's that's an impossibility. He's not calling us to be God. He's not calling us to be good. Because us being good would never be good enough. He's calling us to be imitators of God. Not intimidated by God. Not immune to God. Be imitators of God. Alexander the Great, it was said that his military endeavors were so great because of this reason. And I quote, His military life sprung out of his imitation of the warriors of Greece and Troy, end quote. So, the point is, you are imitating somebody. Everybody is imitating somebody. Who are you following? Who are you imitating? Who are you mimicking? Who you are imitating, that's who you will become. So who is it? That you are imitating. Let your flex be, I am an imitator of God. Period. Christ came so we could be imitators, not just image bearers. So don't just be an Instagrammer of God, be an imitator of God. Don't just be a, a, a knower of God, a laborer of God, a, a worker of God. Be an imitator of God. Imitate Him. Don't just be a Kindle reader of God. Be an imitator of God. Don't just be a minister or a partaker or a spectator of God. No, you be an imitator of God. So, first of all, we need to know we can't imitate Him in everything. However, here's the good news. What does this say, church? As beloved what? It is possible to imitate God in some things. Not everything, but some things. We can give thanks, right? Jesus took those fish and loaves, and what did he do? Gave thanks. I pray before he fed the masses, he gave thanks. I pray on Thursday of this last week before you fed the masses that you gave thanks. Did anybody give thanks? Yes, anybody give thanks? All right, yes, I'm glad you did. I pray before you ate the turkey, you gave thanks for the turkey. Amen? I hope before you ate the ham that you prayed and gave thanks for the ham. And then after you ate the ham, you prayed to repent of eating the ham because it's the inferior meat. Jesus did not send the demons into the turkeys. Did he? He sent them into the pigs. Jesus gave thanks. How do we imitate God? We give thanks. But here's the kicker. You can't be thankful for what you're entitled to. If you feel like you're entitled to something, you're not going to be thankful for it. You feel like you're enti- The only thing we're entitled to is hell. Period. So we ought to be thankful. Right, Jesus lived a very thankful life. He was always thankful, always thanking the Father. This reads very clearly, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Okay, there's, there's a lot being said in these three words. As beloved children. There's a ton being said here. First of all is beloved This doesn't say as bemoaned children, right? God the Father loves you. If you're in Christ, you're a child of God. And He loves you. He's not mad at you. He hadn't had it up to here with you. He's not done with you. He's not over you. You're beloved. He's not bemoaning you. He loves you. You're his child in Christ. And and he loves to love you. You are beloved. You know how much better children respond to being beloved rather than being bemoaned? If a child feels like they're a hindrance, they probably won't respond so well. But if they feel like they're beloved, they may respond a little better, right? 
You're not bemoaned by the Father. You're loved by the Father. Now, for some, this may not be the this whole family, children of God, and the calling God Father, you may struggle with that some, and that may be hard for you. Maybe you didn't have the greatest childhood. But in Christ, we're not only God's children, we're, we're His beloved children. And the image here of little children is following their parents, right? You, you ever hear somebody say, like father, like son? You ever hear that? <laughs> or he's his father's son, or she's his, or she is her mother's daughter, I had John ask me the other day, Dad, do you miss being a kid? And, and you know, the, the one I'll say this about missing being a kid. I never miss being a kid more than wishing I could go back and sit at the kids' table at Thanksgiving. Well, that'd be a blessing, wouldn't it? Because the adult table sometimes turns into the kids' table. And do you have kids? If you have kids or grandkids, you remember when you were the most patient parent? And then you had kids, right? That kind of killed that. So these are children. God is patient with us. He loves us. He is long-suffering with us. He cares for us. We are His children, right? And He loves us in Christ. This is who we are. An expert in parenting was asked this question. What's, what, is the, what is the best way to raise children? He gave three ways to raise children. You might want to write these down. The three best ways to raise children. Number one, by example. Number two, by example. Number three, by example. So how are we as children, right? If we're in Christ and we're children, how are we going to imitate God? Do we have an example? Is there somebody that can show us what it looks like to imitate God the Father? Do we have an example? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. You want to see God the Father and see His character and see His conduct. And that's the way we imitate God in His character and in His conduct. Well, how do we know how to do that? We imitate His character and His conduct by looking at His Son. Colossians reads this way. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Imitate the image of the invisible God. If you want to imitate God, imitate the image of the invisible God. That means imitate Jesus goes on to say, He's the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things. And in Jesus all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Jesus might be preeminent. For in Jesus, listen to this, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So if you want to see the Father, look to the Son. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So the only way we can even attempt this is we have to be children of God. The only way we can be a child of God is to enter by grace, through faith, in God's Son alone so in what ways can we imitate god well let's just look to jesus one way is the fruit of the spirit when you become a believer the holy spirit lives inside of you and then you get access to the fruit of the spirit how do we imitate god love joy peace patience goodness gentleness faithfulness kindness Self-control. These are ways we imitate God. Uh, verse 32 in chapter 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So if we want to imitate God, we forgive like the Father forgives. The forgiven, not only can we forgive, we must forgive. The forgiven must forgive. We're to be holy, Jesus says. For I am holy. 
Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus says. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, uh, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that, listen to this, you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Imitators of God. You ever had somebody say to you, Man, just think about how this, the other day we were with family and friends and Brady laughed a certain way and somebody looked at me and said, man, she looked just like Tanya when she laughed like that. I'm grateful that she doesn't look like me, amen? (laughs) But doesn't it warm your heart when somebody looks at you and says, man, I see you and your child. I see you and your grandchild. Doesn't that warm your heart? How much more must it warm God's heart? When somebody looks at you, believer, and says, man, they've been with Jesus. They've spent some time with the Lord. Amen. We are his children, like father, like son. We are to imitate him in any and every way that we can. You know that that, that bracelet that had the WWJD on it several years ago? Several years ago now, probably. They first came out. Well, the origin of that WWJD goes back 130 years to a guy named Charles Sheldon who wrote a book called In His Steps. And he asked the question in that book, what would Jesus do? And he really challenges parents and adults and students and teachers and businessmen and skilled workers and anybody in any area of life, in any situation. You just need to ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? That is the way we imitate God. What would Jesus do? If we want to imitate God, we look to the Son. Okay? And we do this as beloved children. So by what means will we know how Jesus imitated God? Because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Jesuses out there being preached and taught that are not the Jesus of the Bible. There's a lot of Jesuses out there that are fashioned to people's own liking that people are saying, follow this Jesus and this is who Jesus is. No, how do we know who Jesus is? How do we know how he conducted himself and his character? We look to the word of God, the Bible, the truth. The truth sets us free. Not my truth, not your truth, not their truth. It is the truth who sets us free. Jesus said, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is true. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. You'll obey my word. So if you're going to know how even to a, attempt to imitate God as beloved children, you got to get into the word to see how Jesus conducted himself and carried himself. You want to imitate God the Father? you got to imitate God the Son. If you're going to imitate God the Son, you got to get yourself in his word you got to set time aside and get in the Word. Read it. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Journal through it. Listen to it on audio, books, however you can. Find a way to expose yourself to the Word of God on the regular. On the regular. This is God's book. This is God's... This is the manual sent from the manufacturer himself. This is God's book. It doesn't need to be rewritten. As so many today are trying to rewrite the Scripture. It doesn't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread and reread and reread and reread. It is the most documented and most reliable document in the entire ancient world. I read, a, I read something this week that just, wow, listen to this. I'm, I'm quoting, based on manuscript evidence, hard Manuscript evidence. Based on manuscript evidence, we have a thousand times more evidence that Jesus Christ existed than we do that Alexander the Great existed. There's no more reliable ancient work. There's no more reliable documented writings in the history of the world than the Bible. So read it. God didn't give it to us to change it. We're not to change Scripture. Scripture's to change us and enable us to be imitators of God as beloved children. Man, this, I just, I've been been meditating on this all week. I can't get over this. I cannot get over this. As beloved children, we are to imitate 
our Father. So you got to open your Bibles to imitate God. And by the way, if, if you're a part of a church, I know we have a lot of people worshiping with us on television. We have a lot of people worshiping with us online today. If you're part of a church and you never hear the phrase, open your Bibles or take your Bibles or turn with me into your Bibles, it's time to get a new church. Because our sole responsibility is to open the Word of God and to proclaim it. Period. You don't want to hear my opinion on anything. I assure you of that. We need to hear what God has to say, not what I have to say. Also, uh, we, we are to imitate Him. The Bible says, as was His custom. Jesus would often go to the synagogue, as was His custom. What you're doing today, come into worship. I hope this is your custom. Parents, do not make church optional because your children will find it unnecessary. Do not make it optional. Prayer is another way we can imitate God. What did Jesus do? He prayed. He prayed to the Father. He spent time. Even His disciples, they could have asked Jesus to teach them anything. And they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. That's how we imitate God. We imitate God by imitating those who are imitating God. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Through discipleship. We imitate God by imitating churches, imitating churches. Paul says that in 1 Thessalonians. He says, you uh, become imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus. Marriages need to imitate marriages. Husbands need to imitate other husbands who are loving their wife as Christ loved the church. And wives need to imitate other wives who are submitting to their husbands as to the Lord. And children need to imitate other children who are obeying their parents. And we can go on and on. And on. These are just practical ways that we can imitate God. Love the lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He loved the lost. He came for you who were lost. This is the way we imitate God. Take these and invite people to come to hear how much God loves them this Christmas. This is how you can imitate God. By inviting them to be a part of our Christmas offerings this year. We can say pretty quickly here that this word children, if you think about your own children, and we look at this and we say, man, this is just setting me up to fail because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do this all the time. I'm not going to be able to do this well. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fail. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Your think about your child. Is your child perfect? Maybe precious, right? but not perfect. We're not called to imitate God as perfect people. We're not called to imitate God as little gods. We're called to imitate God as little Christ, as uh, God's mini-me's, right? Imitate Him the best we can, but as His children, meaning God is patient with us. He gives us grace. He, he, he knows we're going to stumble. He knows we're going to fail. You're not always going to nail this, okay? But here's the difference between success and failure. When, when, when somebody is successful, it connects them to people, right? Success gives us fans. When we're successful, we have people who are, who are fans, right? Success is different in failure in that when we fail, it connects us with people. Not to people, but with people. Other people who have failed. So success gives us fans while failures give us friends. And Jesus said this of those canceled people and outcast people. Jesus called them friends. God's going to be gracious with you as you attempt to imitate Him as Christ, as you follow Christ. So don't think you have to get it right every single solitary time but know this Jesus became a man for you so men be a man after God's own heart women be a woman after God's own heart boys and girls be boys and girls after God's own heart Christ came so we could be imitators of God not just image bearers of God amen don't just be a proclaimer of God a seeker of God a teacher of God but imitate him there was a soldier in Alexander the Great's army, and he wasn't so great. He was cowardice. And Alexander told him, he said, look, man, you're going to have to either drop the cowardice or drop the name. Because my name's not going to be associated with a coward. Church, you either be like Christ 
or stop calling yourself a Christian. One of the two. Jesus told his own people, the Jews, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. If you're not a child of God, you're a child of Satan. There is no in-between. Outside of Christ, you don't belong to God, you belong to Satan. In Christ, you belong to God, you're his child. So for you, which one is it? Who are you imitating? Who are you mimicking? Who are you following? What area of your life for the believer, what area of your life do you need to work on in that imitating and mimicking God? What area? Is it, is it in your Bible study? Is it in prayer? Is it in uh, reaching out to the lost? Is it in sharing your testimony? Is it in serving? Is it in giving? What area is it in being thankful? What area do you need to imitate? What do you need to work on? Well, give that to the Holy Spirit today. Be honest. Say, Holy Spirit, I know I've not been imitating like I should in this area. Could you help me? He'll help you today. Ask Him. An unbeliever, listen, God's ready to forgive you in Christ. <laughs> you, outside of Christ, you are following the course of the world. You're following the prince of the power there. You're, you're, you're imitating Him. But in Christ, God's ready to forgive you. So stand with me as we pray. Father, we love you. We praise you for your word. We ask for you to move in this time of response. Have your way as we worship and song and sing and let those who need to come forward to make a decision to be baptized or join the church or maybe answer a call to ministry or pray about a place of serving or come to the altar and just pray, Holy Spirit, help me in this area where I'm not imitating you as I should. I pray you'll open up their heart. You'll give them courage. You'll give them boldness to come forward. Lord, if there's anybody worshiping with us in person today, if there's anybody worshiping with us online today via television and they are they are not a child of God they've never trusted in Christ as their personal savior they don't belong to you I pray you'll convince them of that let them see that for themselves convince them of their sin Lord let them see Jesus who has come to save them from their sin and let them call on the name of Jesus to be saved today Open your heart, dear friend, and just cry out, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm convinced of my sin. I'm convinced that Jesus is the only one that can save me. And today, I surrender. I give up. Forgive me, Lord. Come into my life. I'm ready to follow you. Call on Jesus' name and you'll be saved today. Lord, we give this time of response to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing and you come as we worship.